Hi guys, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here at this beautiful high school. Um, well, I came to U.S. when I was 17 and I went to five different high schools in the U.S. and uh, it was a lovely experience for me because I had to catch up my elementary process, middle school process during high school time period. So for me, I had to learn English and catch up all those materials. So it was a very difficult time period for me, but it was also an unforgettable memory. I remember before my graduation, I had to quit my high school during daytime because I had to find a job and support the family in the U.S. So when the day I find out I will not ever to take a um, high school yellow bus anymore, it was very sad and emotional for me. I don't know about you guys though. Uh, well, before I uh, introduce my country and my story, I want to ask some questions to you guys. I know this is a beautiful afternoon. You all are here, and it's it was midterm season for me at my college, but for you, I don't know. Uh, maybe quiz is coming up, maybe busy a study, but what are you trying to accomplish during this workshop? What do you want to learn? And what are you interested in? Kids, what are you interested in? Yes. Just learn more about the people of Korea and also the government system. Sure. Well, this is my uh, North Korea children who are suffering most of the time in North Korea. And I also, uh, during my uh, youth and my childhood, I also had a chance to witness my uh, orphanage system in North Korea during my repatriation. I was born in 1991, and this is my remaining family out of nine people in the family member. And this is my mother, and she lives in Virginia right now. And uh, uh, this is my older, one of the oldest sisters. Um, she was born in 1987, and she was 10 when we were escaping our hometown. And this is me when I was 14 years old. And this is the picture I would like to share is um, after we came to China, uh, I was uh, seven years old, first time when I escaped my country and I grew up in China for 10 years. And I was lucky enough to uh, protected by him, he was a youth pastor and he um, raised about uh, six or seven North Korean children in his house for two years and we were uh, fed, educated, um, and we were provided the daily needs. And this is the place where I started to learn how to read, how to write the Korean texts through the Bible verses, memorizing them and copying them um, and trying to study Bible. And uh, that was the first moment that I was learning about the gospel and uh, become the Christian. Um, it's, it's hard to go back to my hometown, so I would like to ask everyone to close your eyes and try to follow through the steps with me. Um, I, I don't know if you guys went to Montana, but there's a one log cabin uh, in the top of the mountain. Uh, so it was made with wooden log. And let's go through there. So there's a one big mountain surrounded by the greenery mountains and in the middle there is only one house made with a wood log and when you reach to that house inside of the house there's a concrete floor it was cold and it was open ceiling and there's holes here and there and I was sitting in the middle of the ground I was hungry cold and waiting for the parents to give us some food that was my house and you can open your eyes so I have a question to you guys. Have you guys ever experienced a hunger or starvation in your lifetime? Maybe you guys were so busy to study exams and didn't eat like one or two meals when you experienced that of hunger. Yes, no? Yes? Yeah. How did you feel? Very hungry. Very hungry, right? So starvation feels to me like um, one or two days we were hungry and we were thinking about the food um, and our mouths trying to dry up. And about three days or more later, you will feel nothing, uh, but only stomach kind of starts to sore 
painful, and there's no energy, you are tired and sleepy. And one time I experienced when I was little, um, around like six years old, and we were hungry for straight, uh, straight 10 days. And only thing we could find was the cold water that we collected from the nearby river. And we were containing that river by water in the big jar in the house. And we were drinking that water for 10 days without any other food. And we were hungry. And uh, one day we were, uh, we were so hot. So my brother was five years old and I was like six and a half and almost seven. And we were sleeping and tired, so we were crawling on the concrete floor, and we were finding the coldest spot on the concrete floor because our body developed a high heat because the, we were so hungry and um, we were hot, so we were looking for the coldest spot. And one of the neighbors from the village came to our house that day, and they found out and they suggested my grandmother said, well, they're dying right now. And the last moment you feel by starvation is high temperature in the body, and if you don't eat anything after a few hours a day, then you will die uh, within sleeping. So we were counting hours at the moment, but we didn't know. And that's how the older lady found out and pity on us, and they granted one kilogram of corn to our family, and my grandmother quickly smashed that, and they made a porridge, and we ate that porridge, and we went through that moment and survived again. So I want to share stories that happened when I was six years old. And those memories are kind of unforgettable memory in my lifetime, uh, which is the first memory I want to share is when my grandmother uh, and my mother found the six newborn mice under the stone. And they were so excited to find it because they think that was the best source to uh, help our malnutrition. And that's the meat, right? The newborn mice. Uh, so they boiled in the stone pot, like ours. And then when my mom smashed it with the spoon, it just completely uh, gone. And then it became like a silver colored meat soup. And then they were deciding which kid they want to feed that because uh, all of us were malnutrition and we were like big belly skinny bone uh, and we all were like really walking uh, like golden right so um, I was lucky enough to be chosen and I had um, like opportunity to train that and there's no salt no other elements only water with newborn mice boiled so I drank that and before I drink that soup, actually I was so weak, so I was almost not able to walk, um, and my hair was turning to yellow <coughs> thing, and it was like it, it, uh, sticking out. And then when you brush it, it doesn't listen. Right now, when you see my hair is very calm and long and black, right? But at the time, it was totally different. So after I drank that mice soup, my hair tried to, uh, well, started to turn to black a little bit, and then it's slowly calming down. So I will say, newborn mice was the good miso for malnutrition medicine. Well, if you want to try it, I don't recommend it. Um, and I also want to share some our daily routine. Uh, we will wake up in the morning and we will love each other because at night we were uh, burning the dried wood skin as our fire torch because we didn't have electricity in North Korea, especially for the countryside. It's really rare to get the electricity. Another reason we keep uh, getting shortage of electricity is that the electrical wire in North Korea is made of silver. And at the time, a lot of people, they were exporting silvers and uh, copper to other country in exchange for the food. So they were cutting that um, at nighttime um, and then they were selling it. So the next morning we found out there's no wire, like a chunk of a wire on the, on the street and there's no power. So um, later on, of course, the government find out that instance happened occasionally. So they made a, a advanced law, which is they punished them severely. So some people, they got publicly executed and some people, they served their lifetime in the prison um, and uh, uh, like teaching the village and people say you should not do that but of course 
we don't have any food and we are dying, we have to find a source to make the money, right? So that's how we were fighting our daily life. So the burning torch was our main source to get the light at night. And the main reason to get that was my mom was sewing by hand, uh, <coughs> like, uh, like the gloves, hats, and clothes during the daytime to nighttime until we go to bed to uh, hopefully we can sell that in the market and exchange some food for the next time, right? So I was the one who can hold that torch near my mom. And uh, next morning when we wake up, all those uh, like burned ash was we, when we breathe in, those stains, black stains are staying here. And when you see the, uh, the Japanese soldiers in the movie, there's always mustache on here, right? And it was really funny for us when we were little kids. So next morning when we wake up, we were pointing each other, oh, it just looks like a Japanese soldier, something like that. And then that was the uh, funniest memory we have. Well, the next memory is a little bit sad because um, a lot of things happened in that year. So I couldn't track the timelines for you because it takes hours for us to track it. But one of the memory is when my youngest brother died. Uh, he was two months old. And at the day when my mom delivered the baby, he was a premature baby. And that um, day when we received a letter about my father's death from the government, and my mom heard of that news, and then she was in like very sorrow mood, sad, um, and angry. And the next morning, she delivered the premature baby. And that morning, morning, my oldest sister she came back from the treat a uh, trip to find the food, but she didn't get any uh, food for from her trip. So she didn't even stay in the house more than an hour, but she left the home and promised it to return at midnight or the next day, but she never returned it to us. It's been uh, almost 20 years now, but we don't know where she is and whether she's still alive or not. Um, so after our oldest sister got missing, uh, my mom, she doesn't want to lose her oldest daughter, right? So she left the newborn baby to us, which was my grandmother was there at the time. And my older sister, um, Esther, she was 10 years old, and I was six and a half, and there was five years old boy, and uh, the newborn baby. So my mom left, and then to try to find my missing sister, and that journey took about two months. And then during those two months, my sister Esther, she has to carry the baby, go to the village, and begging those moms who have a baby, begging them to give some milk for the baby. And for the first few weeks it worked out, but later it didn't. So what we did was we went to the, uh, uh, I think we called it uh, mill work. In North Korea, we still use that mill work. That it's uh, like a wooden uh, piece that uh, just, uh, using gravity, we smash those grains in pieces and then we collect it and those skins we were left over in the millwork. Um, so we went there multiple times and collected those corn skins, make it more soft, and then we collect those softer parts, come home, make a porridge and feed it to the baby. As an adult, when we, uh, like, like toddler, like me, when I tried that porridge, it was really rough because it's made out of the corn skin only. But, those, uh, but that newborn baby, he was trying so hard to eat that food, and he was happy and smiling. But unfortunately, right before my mom returns, about three days before she returns, my baby brother died on the concrete floor. And uh, my grandmother, uh, she uh, buried him right next to our house. And after my mom came back from the trip, at the time my father was in prison, my oldest sister missing, my youngest brother died, and my mom came back from the trip where she searched in North Korea, and she also went to China to find her relatives and see my sister went to China for help. But there's no news, and she brought like bags of milk powder, rice, and some bean paste from China. She carried like 
big, big bag um, with her. But next day, the villager found out she came from the long trip, and then the officials walk into our house. They grabbed all the food that she brought from China, and they dragged my mom to the detention center. She got kicked, she got beaten, um, she was detained for three days, and three days later, she went back home with blood covered her face. It was midnight, it was really unforgettable moment for us. And she walked in the house, so we burned the torch and looked at her, and then she was keep bleeding because one of the officials got drunk, and then he hold the wood, uh, wood stick, and then he just came on my mom's head. So she had a big scar, and she was bleeding, and she has to escape that area to find us. So we ran to the mountain, hiding for three days, and then my sister and I, we found out my mom was losing her conscious. So we decided to come back home. And of course, later, the officials came back to our house again and tried to take her from us. But they found out my mom was lost to conscious. She was sick very severely. So they didn't take her. They said, once she get better, we will come back again. But that illness took about two months and she barely walks and she uh, was uh, not able to talk uh, and she was just sick and we were helping her out but we didn't have any medicine we didn't even have salt to sanitize her scar um, and then at the end about two months later my grandmother she was starved and it was june uh, it was summertime during uh, 1998 and one day, my grandmother, um, she was trying to chop the wood and make some fire and make our room warm. So when she chopped it, she was hungry and starved, so she didn't have energy. And one of the pieces of the wood just uh, um, was stuck on her left hand, and there was a small scar happened. And she was trying to collect wild vegetables around the house, and she was collecting it. And there was a toxic... Um, uh, vegetable there. So when she collecting those vegetables, all those poisonous uh, elements went into the scar. And about one day later, she started to develop a big blister. And about two weeks passed, that blister got bigger and bigger and it reached her arms. And the two weeks later, she started to say something that we couldn't understand, which was like calling my sister's name and saying, Esther, Esther, bring down that fire, the potato is like, um, it's, it's burning down, the rice is burning down, and keep saying that words, but we didn't have it, um, grown ups who can make a fire in the house, so our house was cold, dark, and we didn't have any food. And her last wish was to eat one baked potato, but unfortunately we didn't have potato at the time, we didn't have any food, so we were not able to provide one bag to potato until the moment she passed away. That's my uh, grandma's uh, story, and I was raised by my grandmother, so I was very attached with her, but um, about three days before she passed away, I got up from her uh, blanket and I moved to my mom's side. And at the time, I was too young, and I didn't know what was the death meaning. So I didn't cry, but I saw my mom was crying all day long. And she was sick, and she barely moves, but she has to clean my grandmother and try to pack with her um, blankets. And we didn't even have coffee, so we, uh, my mom, she covered my grandmother's body with plastic. And then two gentlemen from the village came to our house and witnessed that, and they helped my mom uh, with the one uh, trolley, and uh, put my grandmother on top, and then they left to the mountain to bury her. After my grandparents uh, passed away, my father was not there, my sister was not there, and only little ones in the house. And then there's about 10 uh, people from the village, they all had responsibilities in the village and taking the government roles, and they came to us, and they're asking us to leave that village. 
because that year, about two weeks later, we had to vote for Kim Jong uh, Kim Jong Il as the supreme leader of the country, and as a citizen of North Korea, we have to vote for him. And then they're asking us to go back to our original city where we came from, which is Mosan City, and asking us to vote in the city instead of countryside where we lived more than three years. But at the time, my mom's condition was not well. Uh, we were so little, we didn't have a food or shoes, so we were begging them and crying to them, please don't let us leave this home. But the last word that they said was, if we find out after 15 days later, you guys are still living here, we will burn this house down. So I think that words completely broke my mom's heart, which was, we don't have any country to get protected and our government is asking us to leave our home. So one night, my mom asking us to pack and get ready, and then we were standing in front of the house. It was dark night and July 18, and my mom is asking uh, us to remember that moment, that house. It was, we didn't even have a lock, so we were uh, uh, sealed the house with the wires, and then, uh, we were uh, taught that uh, no matter where we go or how far we reach to the world, don't forget your origin. You are North Korea. You were born in North Korea. So I think that um, like imprinted in my mind as of today as well. And that's why I can say my identity is North Korean. And it's very unfortunate for me to born in North Korea but that's where I was born. And that's how uh, I started to, to think about my identity while uh, growing up. But after we came to China, so when I was seven years old, my mom took me in her backpack and we walked three days, uh, well, four days, three nights. We were walking on paved roads, crossing mountains, and uh, uh, we were hiding in the bushes during daytime because we don't want other people to find out we were going to China side. So uh, we were hiding uh, during daytime and walk at night. Finally, we reached it to the river to the side, and then uh, my mom she put me in her backpack, and she was holding my sister's hand. My sister was holding walking cane, and we swam across the Tumor River. So Tumor River's water wave was a, a little high and the level reached my mom's uh, uh, wrist, uh, what's it, wrist? Waist. waist. Yeah, waist. And then uh, my sister's chest. So it was a little high, uh, high uh, water level. So we difficult and struggled a little bit, but about 40 minutes later, we finally made it to China side. And I thought when I come to China, my life will be happy after all. But uh, like during 10 years in China, we were hiding, um, we, were, we were running, and we were lying to the Chinese people so we came from South Korea instead of North Korea. We have to hide our own identity because once the Chinese government or Chinese people find out we came from North Korea, then they will report to the officers we will go up and send it back to Korea forcefully. So we were running around and I was not able to go to school in China because I don't have any birth certificate. Um, but during 10 years, my mom and my sister, they sent back more than four times to North Korea. And myself, I sent back to North Korea forcefully twice. And the last escape was in 2006, which is Halloween day. We swam across the dark and cold Tuma River again and reached to China side. And since then, uh, our story sent it to the missionary who lives in Seattle, and he sent our story to the UN, and that took about uh, a year to process. And then they finally said, well, they can grant us refugee status. And then we came to China, and we were able to get protected uh, by the UN at GCR. Um, and in December, we came to Beijing, China. We entered the UN uh, official building, and we got protected, safe, safe, we granted safety uh, from the UN for 15 months until we come to the United States. 
And about 15 months later, we have, well, during 15 months, we have to go through a lot of interviews from US government, UN, Chinese government, and South Korean government. So each time we have to go through that, we have to tell all the story since I was born to the moment when we get to there. So we have to repeat stories again and again, and they're testing whether we are lying or not. Um, and after we pass that uh, interview level, we will get uh, refugee status, and we flew from China directly to the USA as legal refugees. That's how my uh, new life began. And um, I would like to share about the history, right? Like my country, North Korea, what is that country and why those people are suffering and why my family died. So this is North Korea in the map and I think the overall map is smaller than Maryland State. I think it's a big, uh, smaller than the lake in, in the, right next to us, right? Um, but small country is very, uh, but it's very loud because of the missile test, human rights abuses, and a lot of things happen in social media, and you probably heard about this country already. And we have China on top and South Korea at the bottom. So this is the Yalu River, uh, the border between China and North Korea. And this is the North Hanyang province where I was born. And this is the Truman River where we crossed the border and we lived in the NT area for four years. And this is the communist countries in the world still exist right now, which is Vietnam, Cuba, Laos, China, and North Korea. And uh, North Korea is about adapted the ideology from uh, Karl Marx and Leninism, and they say their Jute ideology is advanced version of communism ideas from him. Uh, and for that part, the communism is a philosoph philosophical idea. And then the North Korean ideology Jute is a little bit different, which is uh, the communism says everything belongs to community, we are developing equally and we are growing and getting better equally, but North Korea's idea is man-centered ideology, which is the leader is important and that's why their leader has to be um, idolized the figure and that's why they make some big stories to cover their leaders and how great uh, uh, how heroic works he has been done since he was 14 years old and where he was born and uh, he was considered as back to mountain bloodline and all kinds of uh, uh, stories that made to make their leader as a like god figure in the country so we all my mom also say like oh Kim Hir Sung was the good guy and he was uh, during his leadership we all uh, was fed good and we didn't have clothes to wear, but we had enough food to eat. She still says that. But I think it's because when he took power, they were setting up the Jute ideology at the time, and it was not finalized and not completely controlled. And they were saying self for alliance, and they were teaching the Marxism and Leninism in the school system. And they were forcing us to uh, follow the 10 principles and making us memorize them since we were toddlers and all those important things. And this is the dear leader of our first leader in North Korea, Kim Il-sung. As you can see, he looks similar to the current leader, Kim Jong-un, right? Because Kim Jong-un, he didn't look like him before, but we, as North Korea, we all think he is the god in North Korea and he's the main leader and he's the hero of our country, we trust him more than anyone else. So the new leader, well before I vote that, this is the uh, statue of Juche in North Korea in Pyongyang and this is the timeline uh, where Juche finalized. I think the Juche ideology was finalized around 1965. So. Around this time period, Kim Il-sung 
was setting up the system and trying to convince people to accept that ideology. That's why it was not really severely difficult at the time during my mom's time period. However, when they finalized, when they practicing it, a lot of suppression going on, and controls going on, killing going on, and then uh, the once the Marxism and social uh, the, the uh, Soviet Union completely fought, our country didn't have resources support from other country, so we slowly uh, didn't have enough food to support the people. So they were only feeding the elites group to maintain their own power. So those people like middle class and lower class in North Korea, we don't have um, rations to receive from the government. That's how we were hungry, starving, and a lot of, a lot of people died. So you know, that's, uh, there are about 37,000 North Korean defectors already escaped successfully to South Korea, and they are currently living in South Korea. And right now, they are supporting their family members who are still living in North Korea right now. And there are about 80,000 North Korean people who escaped to China, and they are currently living in China uh, right now. And that's the report released by the U.S. government. Uh, it's called the U.S. State Department's 2021 Trafficking in Persons Report. So you can double check that. So many people asking me, uh, I escaped in 2006 as a last time, and how about the current North Korea? Is it any better, or is it any changes in North Korea? I will say, the government-wise, they never change. They always want to get more control and more power and more economic uh, power through those workers. But there are those civilians, people inside of North Korea, they changed a lot since then. Uh, because in the first time, they realized government is not giving them food, so we have to find our own way to survive. So they started a street market, um, their black market business, their trade individually with the Chinese smuggling uh, items and selling in the market. So they kind of developed the businesses individually. However, they are not completely uh, free to do practice the business by themselves. They have to cooperate with the officials, and local government officials have to um, protect them uh, in, the, in the legal ways. So there's a um, cooperation between business owners and local officials. They have to work together and uh, bribing each other, um, taking advantages. So the difference between him and Song, I would be told that they had a food, and they provided the rations during that time period. But during Kim Jong-il's time, from 1994 to 2005, slowly those rations cut it down and down. So those middle class people, we did not receive any rations from the government. Only elites and the military groups received the rations. And then during Kim Jong-un, uh, when Kim Jong-un took power, many people, they thought, oh, we changed the new leader, young leader, maybe our country will get better and different than all those true leaders but it got worse. Um, so North Korean people generally very disappointed about um, their leadership. So they are not uh, relying on the government, but they don't have power to express that. And because of, uh, uh, I think the current, stage, uh, current currency change in North Korea happened in 2000, was it 2018 or 2016? Uh, 19 around that time period, they changed the currency, and then a lot of people at the group when they saved the cash. Well, in North Korea, we don't save money in the bank because we don't trust the bank anymore. So we are saving cash in the house, but those cash became just paper. So everything was wasted, and um, a lot of people lost their economy. Uh, oh, and then this graph is showing. The missile test uh, during Kim Il Sung time period, and he, this was the beginning stage, and he was developing the mis, uh, the nuclear weapon. So it, there's no many tests, but Kim Jong Il, it was like a completing stage. So he was testing some, and then Kim Jong Un, he was testing a lot of missiles and see how successful it is. And he is they're all crazy, and. 
I would like to give some example, like a comparison between the Western world to my country, North Korea. So North Korean system is exactly copied version of Christian um, gospel, um, but in other opposite way. So we have Jesus as our um, messenger from the God, and he is God's only son, and we trust his words, and so, and then Kim Jong Il and Kim Il Sung was the uh, similar figure in North Korea, like a God's figure. So many people are standing here and they're bowing, bow down, and uh, like showing their gratitude and loyalty. And those foreigners <coughs> in the Western world, when they visit North Korea, they also do the same thing when they go to North Korea. If they don't do it, then consider you are not respecting our dear labor, so you are kicking out from North Korea. And we have a Bible as Christians to follow, um, but in North Korea we have 10 principles we have to memorize since we were going to the elementary school. Um, so we have to memorize this and copy this. And, uh, this is the only Bible we, we have to follow in North Korea. So this is the example of uh, 10 principles. I've heard from my colleagues to say in the Western world, many people, they want to accept or promote socialism in our system. And they're complaining capitalism, how bad it is, and uh, you know, they trying to practice socialism in the country. But I don't know about your opinion, but personal opinion from me, that's the worst idea. I think because the lack of uh, awareness about socialism and communism is guiding us to make a false uh, judgment, and then it will slowly become like Venezuela. The Venezuela, the, the current leader, took so much time on convincing people, brainwashing them, and then finally he took power and the whole country became the socialism country. So I will say the socialism on the text it sounds very beautiful. Everybody shares equally and everybody uh, become rich uh, equally. But as a human being, we have our own programs, we have our um, own uh, ideas, right? And we deserve how much we put effort into something and we should get awarded by that. But socialism, they are not. How much you work hard, they don't give you that much uh, reward because it's all belong to everybody equally. So socialism, many people, they don't want to work hard because even though you work hard or not hard, it's all separate, like equally distributed. So that's how the system falls. And I feel like the system maintained uh, effects by the leaders and the government system. And I believe that capitalism is the best. So we have to protect it and we have to tell the people Socialism sounds beautiful, but practically it's more the system in the world. And this is my work, and I'm willing to end with my, um, my little quote. Socialism sounds beautiful, but it's bitter to taste. And when I was six years old, newborn mice were only made soup I could taste, and my family died by hunger. It was fearful, hungry, and cold. And that's the taste of socialism. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,